And then over here, the first YAMCA in, in New York. And so this is the first one in New York? Yeah. Okay. It built in 1884. It was called the Young Men's Institute. Yeah. From 1884, this was a scene for young men. So can you imagine the scene of these, these you know, young guys who were originally Irish and then became Italian young guys, desperately poor, and this was a place of great love for them. Can you imagine the, what went yeah. on? What went on? Home. <laughs> it was home. Yeah. And the love that was straight or gay, whatever, that was a huge, yeah. important place for them. And you have made this a home for a lot of people. Hello! How are you doing, Mwah. Thank you for so much for having hey, us. Come, really, come, come. Okay, let's yeah. go, let's go. All this is you? Well, this is, I, I have three lofts in this building. And this is called the bunker. And then William Burroughs moved in here in 1975. And that's? And, and that's his bedroom. This here? William's bedroom. It's my guest room. And he came here in 74, 5. Moved to, moved to Canvas in 82 and came back every year. So when he moved to Kansas, I moved all his things into here. So, right. So this is where it was for 20 years of his life. And he came sort of the year before he died in 96, uh, here the last time. Yeah. And then many great Tibetan lamas have stayed here. Yeah. So the energy is a mix of many great minds. So I, I'm a Tibetan Buddhist in the Nyingmapa tradition. Yeah. And these are my teachers. So they come here to give teachings. And, and this over here is our, our dining room. Yeah. We're with William Burroughs and everybody else is in these for, for 50 or 40 years as right. these great dinner parties. I'd love to go around and have a look at some of your work. You said you have three lofts here? Yeah. This was a, one, of an, one of a series of eight paintings of different words like this that I did in 1987 and 88. Right. And we had so many dinners here with the, the, the steaks or the, what, the food that I used to wash it with Windex <laughs> because it was greasy from the kitchen yeah. over there. Right. And then Lord knows this happened to it. Yeah. It got like an alleg alligator skin. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's and like you a... know how sometimes things get in those? I did two years later and they've just hung there ever since. These are very special works to you. And yeah. do you feel sentimental about your works? No. The moment of joy for an artist or a poet is the moment you create it. Then when they're done, they're done. I'm yeah. going to talk about yeah, my yeah. hobby horse yeah. here. Um, I love uh, the story of Dial of Home. Oh. And uh, for me, like I came to New York City and I wanted to be a poet. And so I was very addicted to Penn Sound, this archive of wow. poetry. And I listened to Caroline Bergvall and uh, like soothed me and convinced yeah. me that I was an artist. And I just love, it. like for me that resonates with, with Dial Up Home, people having access to amazing poetry, amazing poets. Um, and what, what was the conception of that for you? How did that come to be. Well, so, uh, in this very loft in 1968, the bed was over there uh, yeah. rather than over there. Yeah. And, and uh, one morning I was c crashing. I probably had coming down from speed and, and booze and whatever it is. And it's like somebody called. Right now. Yeah. And I was very irritated by this gossip. I was saying to myself, this is a lot of, I don't want to be hearing this bullshit. You know, I got sort of, <laughs> and I, the more angry I got, I said to myself, but that's a voice. And I'm a poet. That could be a poem. Right. So that's how Dial a Poem came to be. Each answering unit was 36 inches long yeah. and a lack of cartridge. So it was started very primitively. I have to ask about Andy Warhol's film, Sleep, um, which you are the one and only star yeah. of. And, uh, you know, there's people that brag that they have seen the whole thing, they've had a transformative experience. And I have to wonder, have you watched the whole thing yourself? Well, what, many, how does it feel? Many times I've watched yeah. it. You know, well, just because of, of it happening as a part of my life, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'm uh, sort of neutral to it. I, mean, I just thought I'm amazed this, this thing exists. It's, and it's a great work of art. So I'm just pleased, with, uh, overjoyed with that. Jonas Meekers had something called the Film Co-op. And particularly in 62, he was going full gear. And in 63, I went with Andy every night. And Jonas put four films every night. The new film would be the fourth. I must have seen Ron Rice and Jack Smith a hundred times, always yeah. to get to the fourth film, you know? Right, right, so, right. And I, that's where Andy learned how to be a filmmaker. This because when you see Jack Smith over and over, yeah. you know exactly what he did right, and right. you know what he did wrong. It's, yeah. it's clear what he did wrong. <laughs> yeah. And Andy was, is so brilliant, he was able to figure it out in his own yeah. way. 
It's so like you were already transforming poetry from something on the page to something that people could live with. Where do you think the inspiration for these comes from? Um, do you feel that you are allowing something from the outside world uh, to influence you and then you take, take it and run with it? Or do you feel like um, some of these you are digging out of yourself, that you have things you want to express and you're getting rid of them, putting them out there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the 1960s, I think I, I got that point somewhere, not being a Buddha, not being a really practicing Buddhist, that, if, that you, your, your mind often causes you the most of the trouble or creates the obstacles in your life with yeah. anger and grief or whatever the problems are. And that if you just leave it alone, let things happen. And then when I became a Buddhist, Buddhist it became easy to see that it's true. And, and, and yeah. then someone who just lets things happen in, in a positive yeah. way. And, and so there. I've taken inspiration from you because I never let anything happen. Like, no, but that, that was a part of the equation, all yeah. that anxiety, because we all, all, to, we all took yeah. speed in the fifth, the sixth earth. <laughs> <laughs> So let me get this straight. Am I meant to take away from this that the keys to creativity are uh, Tibetan Buddhism um, and uh, out, like inspiration from the world and speed? Is that the? Is that but, but, but it's always a combination of many other things that happen at the same time. Yeah. But in the 1960s, besides LSD, the drug of choice w was speed, amphetamines. Mm. Andy yeah. Wall took p handfuls. Yeah, as we know, he, he, it was a drug of choice, and, yeah. and me too. It was, yeah. a, and so. You know, speed also creates a bit of anxiety. <laughs> so it wasn't such a peaceful, I mean, one was working and, and creating and doing all these things. Yeah. But, but speed was one, an important ingredient, because right. it, and LSD too, because it broke through concepts. I learned this long before I was a Tibetan Buddhist, is to allow things to happen. More right. or less, we prevent things from happening in our lives by yeah. having a discrimination or something, whether we build it. And if we just let whatever comes to us, allow it to come, it, it, it flowers. Do you feel a little more free when you're using words in your visual art? Uh, less intimidated by the process. No, I feel, never feel intimidated. You never feel no, intimidated no, no. at all. I mean, they're, they require enormous amounts of energy. Right. Both performing. No, nobody ever realizes the thing I do. Like it's like an opera singer, but to create that heat in your body where you somehow you're sweating and this this thing comes out is an yeah. unbelievable amount of energy. It's irrational. Even the big paintings, they were only 56 inches. Yeah. So to do a 56 inch painting of those rainbow poles, you need eight people, four guys, heavy guys, pulling this little squeegee, yeah. and two other people doing the paint simultaneously, yeah. and it becomes this moment with this yeah. master printer, it's just as exhilarating <laughs> as a Rube Goldberg. Yeah, so, okay. so this, I did a project that just came to completion with an iPhone, and what I chose to do with the park in San Francisco, Buena Vista Park, it had a ribbon path, you know, like Central Park, and Dorothy's Yellow Brick Road. The concept was the rainbow paintings, you, as you walked on the path, you walked on top of the rainbow paintings and, and they slipped under your feet yeah. around to the other end and, and a poem came out of the meadow. So from doing dial a poem in 1968 to doing this in 2019 yeah. on a telephone, yeah. I'm sort of amazed at that, at that trajectory. All right, we've seen all the history here. What is next? <laughs> well, what is next is my memoir. Oh, really? Okay. That I, I wrote and finished a year ago. Okay. And it, I worked for 23 years on it. And it, it was a thousand computer pages. I did my whole life up until now. And, and I, yeah. I, I, the reason I took so long is that I can remember conversations from 40 years ago. And I finished it last September. It was 320,000 words. And tomorrow or the next day, I get the bound galleys. Yeah. So when you get the bound galleys, this thing is real. It's oh, there's <laughs> no day like and, galley day. And, and, yeah. and of course, it comes out in, in March. Do you know so, what she's called? Great Demon Kings. So there. <laughs> she's talking about speed demons, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much you. For, for welcoming to me great, today. This great, is such a great, beautiful great. place. Great. And yeah. uh, I can't wait to see your exhibition and read the, the book. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank great, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John Giorno. Thank you so much.